So you guys have seen my Forte VFX one once before, but that was what, five years ago now? Where I basically just played through one, one of the maps in Quake. Silicon Classics has a fantastic video right now that he made a couple of years ago where he discussed uh, the origins of the VFX one, the products and design that were made for the VFX one, and ultimately how it wasn't really all that successful simply because of its high costs and some of its soft hardware demands were pretty strange at the time, and it really wasn't able to handle upcoming 3D hardware support and acceleration that was just coming out of the market like the Voodoo 2. Remember, this thing doesn't do analog pass-through. But let's look at it from a different perspective of me with the hardware here, um, trying not to completely remember everything Silicon Classics said and look at it from a different perspective. So, this is the VFX1 headset unit here. This is not the whole VR unit. It is significantly bigger than what you would say would be an Oculus Rift. And, well, it's held up well enough to time. Uh, one of the biggest problems I've had with this here is you can see, like, it's falling apart here. Um, there's a... Thankfully, it's held in by Velcro. There's a head pad here, or a padding that goes in here to hold for your head. But the black foam, which holds it all together, is starting to degrade. And it makes an absolute mess on everything, like there's stuff on my table here now, um, anything including your head that you work with. The plastic optics are okay. The LCDs in this are definitely a very low resolution. We can improve on that now. And even they did that with the VFX 3D, whatever. I'm getting a bit of wear and tear here on the headphone attachments. But other than that, when you're playing games of that era on this headset, it's not bad really. So how much did I spend for this thing here? Now, if you go onto eBay right now and try and find a VFX one, I don't think there is anything on there right now. Um, but this unit here, they were expensive even when I was going at them before the VR craze and the Oculus was kicking in here, or pretty much anyone was doing VR. We're going back to the time of like the P5 glove on the market, which is a whole other thing we're not gonna talk about. I paid $400 for this headset, the cabling, the Cyberpuck, and the card. Before that, I spent $200 on another VFX one with the puck and cable, but it didn't come with the VIP card, which is a whole other beast we're gonna talk about in a little bit here now. Uh, the Cyberpuck, on the other hand, this little device here, this is your controller. Now, the head unit has decent tracking for its time. It's good, like, it has a little bit of input lag, but it's not super bad. This here also has tracking abilities as well, and I find that it's okay, but I can find its limitations at time. It contains three buttons on it here, which you can also use as combination buttons with the latest drivers that Forte released, and it uses Access Bus. Um, in a nutshell, what Access Bus was, was at the time that USB was going for approval for standardization and everyone was still trying to figure out what to replace serial and parallel devices with, Access Bus was there along with USB. As it turns out, USB became the standard and Access Bus pretty much dissolved overnight. On the VFX1, you can actually plug it in to the back of the unit here, which is great, and then you have this giant 26 pin connector here, which then you can use to um, power, video, audio, access bus. It's one cable between the computer and you. And it's a fairly thick cable as well. But there you go on that. On the other hand of all of this here, with the other side of the cable, you have the VIP card. Now, the VIP card is a strange beast of a device. Um, take a look at this thing. So we have on the back of it here the 26 pin connector. We have another access bus connector if you want for some reason to plug in another access bus device if you had one, or even the Cyberpuck will plug in there because we have an access bus hub built into the unit. And we also have here connections for the microphone output from the VFX1 and the stereo speaker input from the other from your PC. Inside of the unit here we have an Altera FPGA, which is doing a lot of the heavy handling. There's some AT&T chips over here, and there's a fair amount of glue, which is doing access bus support, it's doing the video handling, and it's doing stuff like the tracking, decoding, and of course, interfacing to the ISA bus that this machine has. The machine itself, this little box right here, is, I would say, a force to, re to be reckoned with for the VFX1, because it's quite overpowered for what we're doing. 
just gonna pull it over here for a second. And on the inside, what we have here is that on the very bottom of the unit, there's the VIP card. And you can see above that, we have a nice little 3Com Ethernet 10100 card. And we have a SCSI card, a USB Firewire card, a CNR modem, which is sitting in there for some ridiculous reason, because everyone needs a 56K modem, right? And above that is the video card. Now notice how there's also a cable that is running between the VIP card and the video card. We can't use analog video on this here because the back of the VIP card doesn't have an input or an output or a pass-through like the Voodoo 2 or even like the uh, DXR Hollywood um, DVD decoders. In its place, we're using the Visa feature connector. This is a much, much older um, internal video data bus because ISA bus was too slow for this and ESA bus was, I guess, also too slow for this. And even PCI was a bit too slow. What this did was give you a digital video signal um, to and from that you could connect to um, TV decoders, MPEG decoders, capture devices, um, stuff like that. The VFX1, however, it's a bit of a stretch. Why do I say it's a bit of a stretch? Well, first off, you're limited by color to 256 colors, so 8-bit color, as well as you're strictly limited on your resolutions. I think in some rare instances, you can do 800 by 600. Otherwise, it's 640 by 480. So the other side of this as well is that your video card needs to support this feature connector. So think like the Radeon 9600, or even like most of the GeForce 3 or 4s, and some of the GeForce 2s don't have these connectors at all. However, with earlier versions of the GeForce 2 and a lot of other earlier video cards, some of which are really not all that good, they do have this connector. Electrically, protocol-wise, it's not always the same. As a result, I've had to go through a ton of video cards before I finally found one which was moderately good. This one in here right now is an 8 megabyte um, ATI all-in-wonder. So... That's working, and how do I know it's working? Because when the driver loads, I actually see something on the headgear unit itself. Fancy, imagine that. Uh, Non-compatible devices, you'll just simply see an, uh, no video. Go to the next video card. Raw. All right, hardware aside on this thing here, if you want to see more detailed specs on this, go to the link below, and there's this Vogons page that I basically build up where I was talking about this machine and what's loading onto it. Playing games with the VFX1 is an interesting experience, but it is also a bit of a run through driver hell and resources and IRQ and strange conflicts, which are really things of the past now. We don't have to play with those at all. But when it comes to supporting games, a lot of, there was quite a few games out there that supported it as patches or add-ons or built into it. There was actually a game that was released rather recently that supports both the Oculus Rift and the VFX1. Now, mind you, it's a DOS-based game, but Regardless, to see someone developing for the VFX1 still, I give major props out to you, by the way. For games, however, which don't support the VFX1 under DOS, uh, Forte released what's called VR Mouse, and this comes with the VFX1. Um, you run this program just before you run the game, and it kind of hooks and meshes together support for joysticks and keyboards and all that jazz, and it allows you to make presets so you can like have like tune velocity control you can have all your calibration is can be customized specifically for these games which don't support it under windows uh, forte gives you a driver which gives you the headgear and the cyberpuck support uh, as a direct input device so it looks like a joystick unfortunately that's not all that good for games which require mouse or keyboard because then well unfortunately vr mouse only works under dos not as a windows application but there are applications out there which you can use to translate joystick movements into keyboard and mouse operations. So there's one way to work around that there. Anyways, enough of talking about the hardware and the drivers and all that jazz. Let's plug the system in and play a demo. Plugging this thing in, let's flip it back here again. You can already see I have my two audio cables here which are plugged in for the microphone and speaker. To plug in the VFX1, well, we can just have to plug in the access bus device here for the Cyberpuck. That's easy enough. And, as mentioned before, it's one cable, which links everything together. So, on the back side of the PC here, just simply plug it in and plug it in. 
And once I take my glasses off and I plug this thing in here, we're ready to play a game. So let's get this on and let's get set up. Okay, now once everything here is wired up, now when I turn the machine on over here, that takes a moment here. Uh, it's worth pointing out with this, this is not a single OS booting machine. This is a multi-booting machine here. What does that mean? Well, I'm booting to either Windows 95, Windows 98, or Windows 2000. Now, 95 or 98 and 2000, that's easy. Having Windows 95 and Windows 98 coexist in the exact same system, that's a little bit different there, and that required a batch file that I forget who exactly who it was who gave it to me. Anyways, you know who you are. Thank you very much. You're a godsend about this. I have no idea how to even start how the hell this batch file works. But once Adaptic here goes, there we go. So it starts to boot up the system here. What do I want? 2000 or 9598? I'll say 9598. I last decided to boot Windows 95 on this here. So now it's going to load the VFX driver. So there we go. You're currently running Windows 95. Would I want to change that? No. And the system will continue on here booting. At the same time now, if I look in here, I now see the Windows 95 logo in... Oh, it's really washed out and kind of nasty, but again, those are the LCDs that are in here. So we'll let that boot up. And while I'm doing that, I'm going to take my glasses off here. And I'm going to put this on my head. And then I'm going to realize I cannot see for the life of me um, exactly what is going on in front of me because it is so out of focus. There we go. All right, and it wants my password. And I'll sign under there, this is networked. The other thing about the optics on this here is because remember I had the decaying foam? One of my lenses has a bunch of that decaying foam inside of it, so it's also throwing off my perspective here. I'm not going to turn on the stereoscopic, so simply because that's just going to completely screw with my head right now. Anyways, you're at the Windows desktop here, and I have a couple of games that are already installed, and a few that aren't really totally supported right now, but Quake is known to be uh, one of the best supported games for the VFX one. So let's load that up. There we go. And yeah, yeah, support Quake versions, blah, blah, blah. I have a supported version on here, so I'm just going to hit a key, and it's going to start up Quake on me here, and we're in our typical demo mode. Unfortunately, you're not hearing any audio over this right now because I didn't attach a set of speakers. Again, if you want to see me actually play Quake, like, straight through on one level, without any talking, you hear the audio and all that there. And thank you, Trent Reznor. I love your music as well. Um, yeah, sure, there's the YouTube video. There's the link directly below you. Otherwise, let's just start up a single-player game, new game. And the first thing that's going to happen is I'm going to be horribly... Uh, I'm spinning around. What the hell's going on? Like, it's not supporting the head tracking at all. It is actually supporting the head tracking, but it's also taking input from the Cyberpuck. And this is one of my first problems with the unconfigured, unrefined setup for this here is that right now if i hold this like dead still and i turn sure i can turn i can look up i can look down it's virtual reality but because the cyber puck is doing turns as well if i lean a little bit to the right sure i can turn to the right but fighting to turn to the left comes into play and it's a real challenge <laughs> Sure, I can lean this forward to go forwards, lean it backwards to go backwards. First button shoots, second button jumps, third button is action. So let's see if we can get into the hard area here. <laughs> uh, nope! Oh, I totally made that one. Yes. Okay, well, I'm not going to play hard because this is such a pain. Can I jump back? Sure can. Awesome. All right, let's just go to easy because I'm a little wimp. And we'll go into here. Uh-huh. We'll load the level. Woo! All right, so I also am getting stereo audio here right now, so sound effects and that are working properly. I am working in software rendering right now because OpenGL has been giving me problems on this video card. So one of my main issues is that sometimes enemies and stuff like that blends in. There's the secret's hiding. There we go. Come on. There we go. Yay, ammo. And there I am cheating there right now. Sometimes I'll tilt my puck instead of actually turning my head because sometimes it's kind of annoying. Uh-oh, where are you? There you are. And you're a blob of pixels, but I can see you. Ah, dog. Buddy, there we go. Go get some health over here. At the same time here, by the way, I'm not totally disoriented because I can, like, right here, 
a point of my field of view is still visible. If, like it was pitch black in here, sure, I couldn't see anything, but I can still see my keyboard and my mouse that are sitting right here, which is great because there are still commands that sometimes I may need to issue and I'll need access to the keyboard. Hopefully I never have to touch the mouse because the mouse is currently disabled in VFX mode. Ah. There we go. I think it was someone over here. There you are. And, oh. Come on. There we go. Blam, just like that. I have lighting. Woo. Don't you cause me problems. See, I cheated again. I wanted to use the cyber puck. There we go. Oh, well, he sees me down there. Come on. Let me see if I can shoot you from up here. Sure can. Gotcha. I know there's a secret up here as well. We aren't even going to bother with that. Uh huh. Where am I? I've gotten disoriented. Oh, wait. I know where I am. And there's our exit right there. So as I finish plain Drunko Vision, there we go. Three minutes to get through this here. Got one of the secrets, and I got 9 out of 10 kills. That's fair enough. Well, that was enjoyable. <laughs> And that's the VFX one for you. It's not disorienting. It's disappointing in the graphics, though. Good God. Anyways, so that's another hands-on view with the VFX one. So, sure, $700. It plays Quake fantastic. It has support for a few other games. There is a website that indicated which games were directly supported, which ones required patching. And there was even a list for upcoming games like Half-Life. Unfortunately, games like Half-Life didn't get VFX1 support, which is kind of a major disappointment considering, man, Half-Life would have been absolutely amazing considering just how well Quake, uh, how well Quake was supported. But there you have it. Um, I'm quite satisfied with the VFX1. Um, if you wish to play with VR from that time period, sure, you're going to have to build yourself up a system which supports the VFX1. But the hardware itself isn't that unreliable aside from that foam pad which requires the system to have rigorous amounts of cleaning. So yeah, if you find one yourself, get a hold of it. It will cost you a bit of money to get them because they're so high cost. Thankfully, there is a community out there, I believe it used to be a Yahoo Groups, that did Forte VFX1, where you can actually get the SDK for development of... I'm not sure if it's... I, I doubt it's just driver development, but I believe it's for creating your own patches and that for other games. And as well, there are there is a more recent game out there which supports the VFX one as well as the Oculus Rift. So there it is as well. Um, take a look at that as uh, and just see how you enjoy it. If you want to play it on the VFX one, you're more than welcome to. Anyway, this was the Forte VFX one virtual reality headset from the mid '90s. Um, it wasn't really all that successful. It still sold okay. I mean, we can find units. But uh, I hope you enjoyed looking at this as well. Until next time, have a good one.